So with that, I'd love to welcome everyone to today's UUCD forums. The title is The Changing Map of Palestine and How We Can Influence U.S. Policy Related to Palestine with Israel with Pamela McGinnis. Pamela became active in the struggle for Palestinian rights as a result of a trip to Palestine and Israel in 2011, and she's a member of the board of UUs for, uh, for Justice in the Middle East. So we are so glad that you are joining us today, Pamela. We really look forward to learning from you, and the floor is yours. Thank you all for being here and for the opportunity to speak at this forum of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Duluth. It's a pleasure to be together virtually in this time when we must stay apart physically. I hope you're all healthy and warm as we gather today. As was mentioned in the introduction, today I'll be discussing the effects of the Israeli settlements on the Palestinian people. A story of my father's comes to mind when I speak to you use. He tells of how one fall day when he was pushing the lawnmower on the front yard of our house in Massachusetts, an old car drew, drove up, parked, a man got out and introduced himself as the new minister of the UU church. And he invited my parents to come to a service on an upcoming Sunday. My dad ends the story by saying, we went to that church and soon we became members. And if that man had been a rabbi, we would be Jewish. Um, of course, that really isn't the whole story. My father and my mother came to Unitarian Universalist because of the, dominate, the denomination's strong emphasis on social justice. My father, Donald McGinnis, is a person dedicated to social justice and he has served others in many ways over his long life. Since the 1990s, he's been learning and working against the injustices faced by the Palestinian people. Um, and he served as a president of the Unitarian Universalist for Justice in the East, in Middle East for several years. Unitarian Universalist for Justice in the Me Middle East is a group of Unitarians working to educate Unitarians regarding the human rights abuses exerted on Palestinian people by the Israeli people and the state of Israel. Uh, an acknowledgement I need to make at this point is that I live in St. Paul and I'm speaking from here which is located on land that, has, that was occupied by Native American peoples for thousands of years. You're likely familiar with the history of the removal and systematic murder of the indigenous North Americans in our region. But perhaps you're not so familiar with another example of settler colonialism and forced upon the indigenous Palestinian people that is occurring now. Those of us in UUJME feel that the human rights abuses suffered by the Palestinian people demand the attention and action of moral people in the United States for many reasons, not the least of which is the billions of dollars and the mighty backing provided by the United Nations government and by, associ and by association each of us. It was in 2011 on a trip to Palestine where I first encountered and understood the significance of Israeli settlements in the region. Briefly, settlements are communities of Israeli Jewish citizens built on land that was part of Palestine prior to the establishment of Israel in 1948 and was designated to be the land of the state of Palestine under the 1947 United Nations Partition Agreement. When I first visited settlements and saw adjacent Palestinian communities, I marveled at the differences. These are both communities in the bright and arid Palestinian hill country. The hard soil is tan and dry. The plants are the same drought tolerant species and the human and natural history have been the same up to recent times. For example, one of these neighborhoods has lush gardens, green grass. Oh, I think I might have a slide. Oh, please. Oh, uh, so um, before I go on a little bit, I wanted just to mention, give you a little bit of a map. This is the, the map of the, the United Nations created of the partition plan 
1947. The blue area is land designated as the Jewish state. The pink land is designated as a Palestinian state. And the areas, Jerusalem and the surrounding area was designated as an international zone. This is what um, this area looks like today. Um, the, the green is all um, the state considered the state of Israel and, and um, administered as a state of Israel. And the white areas are areas that are actually occupied by Palestinians and, um, and land that the Palestinians are able to go, go into and farm and that type of thing. All right, so let's talk about um, settlements and the Palestinian communities nearby. One of these neighborhoods has lush gardens, green grass on the boulevards in the streets, large homes with new cars driving on well-maintained roads. The other community has small homes built closer together with minimal greenery, occasional grapevines and olive trees. They have black water tanks on the rooftops for storing drink, drinking water and older cars driving on dusty rutted streets. Sometimes there's an occasional donkey pulling a cart. Exploring further, we note that the newer community is entered by car on a new road guarded by tall fence topped, barbed, topped with barbed wire. There are Israeli flags pr prominently displayed on buildings and there's a guard house that must be passed to enter the community. At times we may see armed Israeli defense force personnel. I will call them IDF at times in and around the community providing protection as, and there also may be armed civilians walking on land surrounding the community. In the other neighborhood, the roads are less well-maintained, the buildings are on average older, and there are never armed Palestinian civilians. Any IDF forces would be patrolling, asserting power over citizens and or arresting people. The surrounding land may be inaccessible or difficult to access by the farmers because of the protected road that is between the landowners and their farms. I observed similar contrast in the ancient city of Hebron on the West Bank. A former main street is closed to cars on one side. Um, the roads lead up the hillside past the cemetery into a community built since 1968. In this neighborhood, built since 1968, the houses and other buildings are all well kept and built in the same architectural style. Some gardens and roads feature um, decorative, are decorative and have watered um, plants to beautify the community. The area has schools, shops, and all facilities important for prosperous community living. But they are accessible only to Jewish Israeli citizens. Here, the IDF guards are abundant and civilians also carry weapons as they move into the countryside surrounding the developed areas. A road with checkpoints and restricted passage leads from this community to new roads that crisscross the occupied territories. Across the street that divides this Israeli community from the Palestinian community are a row of old multi-story homes built of large stone. The former bustling streets has no business or cars along it, having been closed to cars and Palestinians since a massacre of 29 Palestinian worshipers by a Jewish settler in 1994. Inside this old community are market streets with shops closed and abandoned years ago. Other shopping areas have nets over them to protect them from the garbage and projectiles thrown at them by Israeli citizens in residences on higher levels of the buildings. These shops are humble selling food and household items and occasional textile and pottery in a traditional style, often for tourists. The city is busy with cars and carts and pedestrians under surveillance by military guard towers and by the eyes of armed IDF forces driving or walking through these civilians. There are areas in the city walled off, fenced off and heavily guarded that contain schools and other services only to Jewish 
residences. Access to this community is through checkpoints heavily guarded by the IDF. Israelis go easily through the checkpoints inside and surrounding this community. Palestinians wait hours to pass and are frequently harassed by the military as they try to move through this historically Palestinian community. So I'm gonna show you just a few slides that illustrate what I was just speaking of. This is a settlement in the West Bank, a Jewish settlement. Uh, this is one we visited, the yard of a house um, with lush plants and those must be watered a lot. Um, Palestinian areas are not watered beca because of the cost of the water. So here's a pal several Palestinian yards. You can see one grape vine that they certainly water and cherish because it's part of their food. Um, this is the, um, one of the houses near Bethlehem in a Palestinian home. And you can see these big black water tanks on top which they have to have because their water is cut off for several months, usually the hottest. Um, and then, water, then trucks drive around the city selling them back the water that's underneath them that they're not allowed to use. And they are sold the water at much higher prices than the um, Jewish citizens in the neighboring areas. Um, and there, the Jewish citizens never have their water turned off that I know of. So here's a, a, a Jewish settler only road. On this side is close to the town of Bethlehem. On that side is part of this farmer's land with olive trees that are important for um, food and for income. And the settler, the um, Palestinian probably finds it very difficult or impossible to get to those trees. Uh, this is um, one of the large checkpoints that shows um, Palestinian laborers trying to go um, into Israel proper from Hebron or into a settlement from Hebron. So sometimes checkpoints are smaller than this, often they're for cars. They can be reminiscent of an airport security, but these are workers that have to do this every day or every time they go into the uh, area that's, that's Israeli or settler areas. I spoke of the city of Hebron. Um, it's an it's a ancient Palestinian city that probably would have had approximately, well, um, Palestine originally had approximately 4% Jewish residents and uh, Hebron was a very historic Palestinian city. Uh, the orange is areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which means that Palestinians can walk, go freely generally among this area. Um, the city goes all the way over to about here, the really dense part of the city. Um, and here's this, um, this is one of the settlements that I'll mention in a minute, Kiryat Arba. And then here's the part of the city that used to be available to all Palestinians, everybody, but now it's, um, there's checkpoints and walls and the Red Road is closed to Palestinians at all times. Um, and there's more details about this, but um, that's the main idea. So um, I spoke of the city of Hebron. Here's the uh, big fenced area, big, big netting over these um, Palestinian stalls. And the netting, if you, in certain areas, if you walk on the netting, they're just full of trash and all kinds of material that has been thrown down from Isra uh, Israeli Jewish residences above. Uh, this is within the old city of um, Hebron. And this is an Israel, I believe this is a school, but it's the Jewish only building. And here you can see this is a guard tower right outside. At times the roads are closed. Here's a big wall with wires and stakes on the top. Up here to the left is a guard tower where um, IDF would be um, actively watching what's going on. And there's many, many guard towers, small guard towers like that. In addition, there's this huge fortification at the top with an observation area watching people at all times. So I'm going to show this video, which is about one particular town called Al-Walaja. Um, 
there's only a part of this video actually shows settlements affecting the land. Um, but this is just an overall picture of how the land use and um, access for Palestinians has changed since 1947. I'm going to try and make this full screen. But El Walaja is a Palestinian village of about two and a half thousand people, which now lies in the West Bank near Bethlehem. Before the State of Israel was created, Al Walaja land extended over 18 square kilometres. 1,800 hectares of fertile land straddled the lush valley fed by many springs. In 1948, following the Israeli War of Independence, the people of Al Walaja were forced to flee from the Israeli militias across the green line that became the border between Israel and the Jordanian controlled West Bank. Al Walaja now has only six square kilometres of land, having lost two thirds of its original area to Israel. During the Six Day War of 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and the people of Al Walaja have lived under Israeli military occupation ever since. From 1969 onwards, Israel began building the settlements of Gilo and Har Gilo. These two settlements today have a combined population of over 40,000 Israeli settlers and they have begun confiscating Al Walaja land. In 2002, Israel began building the segregation barrier. Again, Israel has violated international law by building 85% of this on Palestinian land rather than on the Green Line. The barrier already cuts through part of Al Walaja land. Since Israel occupied Al Walaja, half of its land has fallen within the Jerusalem municipal boundary, whilst the other half, including people's homes, remains in the West Bank. West Bank Palestinians require a permit to travel into Jerusalem, so all the land north of the boundary is at risk. In the 1990s, the Oslo Agreement carved up the southern end of Al Walaja into Area B, which includes only the built-up part of the village, and Area C, the agricultural land. Israel was given full control over Area C across the whole of the West Bank, and since Oslo, Israel has forbidden Palestinian construction or development in Area C, whilst expanding its own settlements. The future of Al Walaja looks bleak. The people see that they will soon be squeezed into an area of only half a square kilometre, surrounded by the 22 foot high concrete wall or electric fence, with no space for coming generations to develop. Many villages in the West Bank are suffering a similar fate to Al Walaja. So um, that's just an example and other cities, other towns and cities in, in uh, Palestine may be more affected by the settlements than that one. But just to show you what's happening to the, oops, stop. Um, so the West Bank and East Jerusalem were controlled and administered by Jordan until they were taken by military. Israeli military forces in the Six Day War in 1967. Since the Six Day War, the West Bank has been controlled and administered by the government and military forces of Israel and described by the government of Israel as disputed territories. So by West Bank, people usually mean the area that's surrounded by this little, well, the, these little dots, but that's actually less than the West Bank because that's where the, the wall is. And uh, the wall was built within the area, not on the area that was the West Bank. But in general, it's this area here from the Jordan River, the Dead Sea towards the, um, the West. The settlements in Palestine are the outcome of the occupation and also the source of many human rights abuses. These abuses include taking more Palestinian land, destructions of homes, property, livestock, and crops, limitation and movement of civilians, gross inequities in the distribution of water to communities, and physical abuse and murder of unarmed Palestinian civilians by armed Israeli settlers, and the military.
In addition, settlements are a significant barrier to the establishment of an independent state of Palestine, which would result in justice for the indigenous people and most likely a reduction in the violence of the region. These settlements are illegal establishments of citizens into communities of the state, into uh, indigenous communities by the state of Israel. The 1949 Geneva Convention states, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. A number of other international agreements included, including those by the United Nations Security Council and resolutions by other UN bodies, consider the settlement of civilians in areas occupied during armed conflict to be illegal and human rights violations. Settlements are anything from small communities of, of a few homes to large communities with retail and industrial zones that are built on lands in the occupied territories and considered lawfully settled by the state of Israel. There are also small communities of Jews not recognized or considered legal by, this, by Israel, and these are called outposts. As outposts grow, they frequently become reclassified as legal by the Israeli government. The settlements in and adjacent to the large, large and ancient city of Hebron in in the occupied West Bank began as illegal takeover of private property in the city of Hebron and ultimately were recognized as legal claims to live in the area. In 1968, a group of Israelis led by a rabbi refused to leave a hotel they had rented for a short time. In the end, they were allowed to settle in the center of the city and in an abandoned army base. The army base is now the settlement of Kiryat Arba a town of over 7,000 with schools, retail shops, sporting and medical facilities. One advertiser of housing in this settlement claims it is a 30 minute car ride to Jerusalem and there's bus service to Jerusalem and surrounding settlements. The city of Hebron also in the midst of the city has 1,000 Israelis living in enclaves among the 160,000 Palestinian inhabitants. And depending on the time, there are eight, between 80 and 250 Israeli troops stationed in Hebron to protect those Israeli citizens. There are approximately 441 100,000 Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. They live in 132 settlements and 124 outposts. This is excluding the special case of East Jerusalem. There are settlers there also. Um, these figures come from uh, an organization called Peace Now. Israeli settlers are approximately 14% of the total population of the West Bank. There are about 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank. There are two primary motivations for Israelis, and by that I mean Jewish Israelis, um, to move into settlements. Living in settlements is significantly subsidized by the government, so there are economic benefits to living there. Secondly, the belief by Jews that the land was given to them by God, as described in the Torah, which motivates many Israelis to feel it is a religious duty to occupy the land that was meant for them, whatever the cost. It's disturbing to note that a Jewish immigrant to Israel from New York City can easily settle in one of these settlements, while a Palestinian whose family has lived in the area for generations cannot even set foot in the place, never mind obtain housing there. So what are the specific ways that these settlements affect the Palestinian peoples? The settlements affect them negatively in ways far beyond the taking of the land that was once available for farming, building communities, or part of the land dedicated for the Palestinian state. Settlement communities have land surrounding them, which is held as security buffer, meaning that Palestinians cannot enter to farm, cross in any other way um, that buffer. Palestinians who do go near are, or are given permission to cross the land are subjected to verbal harassment. 
and threats and sometimes violence from the settlers or from the IDF members posted to protect the settlers. In 2018 and 2019, there were 265 attacks by settlers resulting in the damage of Palestinian property, such as farm produce, olive trees, buildings, and equipment. And there were 75 attacks which resulted in casualties to Palestinians. From the beginning of 2010 to the end of August in this year, so the last 10 years, uh, uh, two, 22 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank by settler violence, and another 167 Palestinians were killed by military personnel as a result of clashes between settlers and Palestinians. In those same years, 61 Israeli settlers were killed in the West Bank, either in the settlements or upon entering into Palestinian areas. Another result of these clashes is the imprisonment of Palestinians who are protecting their land in pro or protesting settlers and the action and the settlements. Palestinians as young or younger than 13 are arrested and imprisoned by the IDF in a process called military detention. Palestinians arrested by the IDF are always taken into military detention. There is no civil military civil process for Palestinians in these cases. There are also special procedures used on some Palestinian prisoners, prisoners called administrative detention. According to the Israeli Human Rights Organization, B'Tselem, Israel rut routinely uses administrative detention and has over the years placed thousands of Palestinians behind bars for periods ranging from several months to several years without charging them, without telling them what they are accused of and without disclosing the alleged evidence to them or to their lawyers. Some of these detainees are under 18 years old, which is considered to be a child. A report produced by the United Nations Children Fund concluded that the ill treatment of ch children who come in contact with the military detention system appears to be widespread, systematic, and institutionalized throughout the process from the moment of arrest until the child's prosecution and eventual conviction and sentencing. And UNICEF has urged Israel to change their policies. Another consequence of settlements is that Palestinian communities are prevented from expanding. They cannot build new homes or get permits to enlarge the homes that they do have because of the perceived threat to the security and potential growth of neighboring settlements. In some cases, homes and buildings that are approaching, approached by expanding settlements are demolished by the Israeli government in, in order to provide security for the illegal settlers Settlements result in the restriction of movement of Palestinians near the settlements, but also between Palestinian communities. This is because the settlements are connected by to one another and to Israel proper with roads that are created only for Israelis. These roads are separated from the surrounding neighborhoods by large fences. Palestinians are generally not permitted to drive on the roads with limited exceptions or to cross them. Near a community, I showed you the slide of the olive grove that was unable to be visited or uh, maintained by a farmer nearby. This is a common problem for Palestinian farmers. Their land may not be taken directly or immediately, but without access to the land, it might as well be taken from them. Every settlement increases the pressure on the Israeli government to annex the entire West Bank of Palestine. Just this year, recently this summer, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu announced such an annexation plan for the first time. Finally, with the land occupied and accessible to Palestinians, shrinking in acreage and utility Palestinians leaving the occupied territories because of lack of economic viability and human rights abuses. The prospect of viable two-state solution is dis diminishing every year. For many in the region, it seems as the only, 
the, um, the two-state solu solution is seen as the only acceptable outcome. Every new outpost, settlement, expansion of a settlement, and baby born living in a settlement makes a two-state solution more difficult. As I mentioned earlier, as US citizens, each of us is contributing to the building of settlements. I hope you now feel motivated to learn more and more importantly, to take action against the support of these settlements and other human rights abuses by Israel against the Palestinian people, the support that our government gives the state of Israel. So I have just a couple more slides. So what can you do? Um, so consider, well, follow us on UUJME, Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have many actionable steps and lots of educational materials. Consider forming a chapter of UUJME. We have great chapter support, lots of movies that can be used, lots of materials you can use. Um, there's many chapters and there's a chapter meeting once a month. Join our legislative advocacy group. Learn about and support two pieces of legislation. One is um, House of Representatives Bill 2407, which supports Palestinian minors. And the other is HR 8050, which is an anti-annexation bill by the state of Israel. Uh, it's a bill against annexation of occupied lands. Um, there's an excellent book that was written by the Ware lecturer at who who spoke at um, at the UU General Assembly this this summer, um, written by Rashid Khalidi, "The Hundred Years War on Palestine." Um, these resources are all in a um, in a list of resources that I'll put in the chat in just a minute. So thank you for your attention. And um, this is my email, pmcinnis at centurylink.net. Uh, I'm a representative of Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East, and I welcome questions and comments.